the best baseball players find a way to get their uniforms dirty every single game. This message was delivered to me by a major league scout when I was 10 years old at the White Sox youth baseball camp. There are many reasons that I am standing here today giving my senior sermon at JTS and not competing in the major leagues. <laughs> many reasons. I hear there's better money though. But, <laughs> but I have still taken the scout's Torah to heart. You may be surprised to hear me say that after nearly five years of intensive study for the rabbinate, perhaps the most important Torah that I have learned is the Torah of getting dusty. Not dusty like a trophy on a shelf, but in another way which I will explain soon. Suffice it to say, dust represents the defining features of what it means to be mortal. Uncertainty, limitation, error, messiness. But before we get too clouded by the details of the dust, let's take a step back. After a lifetime of running away from his problems, our patriarch Yaakov readies himself this week to confront his estranged and vengeful brother, Esav. Yaakov flees from home after stealing his brother's birthright and blessing, and many years later he flees again, this time from his father-in-law's house, after amassing wealth and building a family. His whole life has been a cycle of conflict, deception, and flight. Finally, it's time for Yaakov to move through his problems and not to see his way around them. We meet Yaakov on the banks of the Yabok River as he readies himself for that confrontation. Yaakov is viscerally scared. Vayira Yaakov me'od, vayetzer lo. Yaakov became exceedingly afraid, afraid and was distressed. And he turns to God in prayer. Katonti mikol hachasadim. I am small and unworthy of the generosities that you, God, have bestowed upon me. Hasilenina, please, God, save me. But then he adds a line, innocuous at first, but quite striking upon closer inspection. Ve'ata amarta, heitev etiv imach, visamti et zaracha kechol hayam, asher lo yisafer merov, you, God, have said, I will deal bountifully with you and make your offspring as the sands of the sea, which are too numerous to count. He gently nudges God, reminding God of the promises that God had made him. He's cashing in his coupon. He thinks that it's time for God to deliver. The promise to which he alludes came in last week's parasha as he fled from his parents' home after stealing his brother's blessing. There, in a precarious moment of flight, Yaakov finds himself between a shaken home and an unknown future, and he falls asleep with a rock under his head, the literal definition of being stuck between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> and in that liminal space, and in that vulnerable moment, he dreams of a ladder that reaches to the heavens with angels ascending and descending, up and down. Just then, God appears to him and makes a promise as follows. And your descendants shall be like the dust of the earth, and they shall spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. Twenty years later, now on the inbound side of that same highway that he had used to travel away from home all those years ago, Yaakov evokes God's earlier promise when he experiences another nighttime encounter with the divine. But hold up the quote side to side. Your descendants shall be like the dust of the earth. And Vesamti at Zaracha Kechol Hayam, I will make your offspring like the sand of the sea. You can all see the difference, right? Yaakov misremembers God's speech. Misquoting God's core metaphor, 
he substitutes sand where God had said dust. Rashi even comments, Veheichan amarlochen. Where did God say that to him? Well, so what, you may be wondering. Both sand and dust are grainy schmutz that I don't in want in my socks, and both carry God's message of innumerability. And both were actually used in promises made to his grandfather, Avraham. Sand, dust, I'm a Lebowski, you're a Lebowski. What's the difference? <laughs> Why should we care that Yaakov has sand in mind instead of dust? The answer is that dust carries a profound resonance in the Torah and a message that Yaakov needs to hear. In Genesis 2, God creates Ha'adam, the very first human being, from dust. Vayitzer Adonai Elohim et Ha'adam afar min Ha'adama. The Lord God created Ha'adam, the first human being, from the dust of the earth. And when Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit and are expelled from the garden, God informs Adam that he will toil and work ad shufcha el ha'adama ki mimena lukachta until you return to the ground, for from it you were taken, ki afar ata ve'el afar tashuv. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. The first human being learns the profoundly humbling truth that he will one day return to his original state. From dust he came, and to dust he will return. To live with, awareness, with this awareness of our frailty and our limits is what it means to be a real human, not in the Garden of Eden, but in the very real world, in our world. And I want to be clear that dust represents more than death. It represents the fullness of the human condition it is our source, our makeup, and our destination. As I said at the beginning, dust represents the defining features of what it means to be mortal. Uncertainty, limitation, error, and messiness. Dust is not suave or sexy. It is sacred. It unites all people with one another and Adam with Adama, humankind with the earth. In his initial promise to Yaakov last week, God actually hints at dust's deeper resonance. After God promises Yaakov that his descendants will spread out like dust, not sand, but dust, God adds, V'hashivoticha el ha'adama, and I will return you to the land. The literal pshat of these words foretells his return to his homeland, but the deeper resonance of Vehashivoticha el ha'adama contains echoes of God's words to Adam, ad shufcha el ha'adama, until you return to the earth just like dust. God wanted Yaakov to pause and reflect upon his dustness, upon his humanity. It seems to me that God wanted to shock him out of his complacency, to encourage him to risk stirring up some dust and to imagine how he, he can emerge from that cloud as a better person with a clearer vision of his path ahead. In order for him to grow into his fullest self and to become a proper forebearer of God's chosen people, Yaakov must come to understand that he is dust and that life is dusty. The human task is to live meaningfully in that, rea in that reality rather than thinking that we can exempt ourselves from the very real struggles that we face. And that brings us back to our Parsha this week and to Yaakov petrified on the banks of the Abok River. Yaakov's lifetime of struggles finally comes to a head. As Robert Alter puts it, the image of wrestling has been implicit throughout the Yaakov story. Now, in this culminating moment of his life story, the characterizing image of wrestling is made explicit and literal. He, Yaakov had told God that he wanted to be like sand, but instead, in Ish, a figure pulls him into the dust for a wrestling match. Vayivater Yaakov levado, vayeavek 
Ish Imo, and Yaakov remained alone, and a figure wrestled with him. The Hebrew word for wrestle, Vayavek, stands out as ambiguous and peculiar. Menachem ben Saruk, Ibn Ezra, and others say that it comes from avak, which means dust. The Shoresh, the root for the word wrestle, tells the story of Yaakov and his opponent getting dusty together. The text is entirely ambiguous as to who his adversary is. Perhaps God, perhaps Esav, perhaps those deep, dark shadow parts of himself, perhaps all of those at once. Perhaps we can't tell exactly who engages with him in this struggle because the whole scene is clouded by a thick, gray cloud of dust. Unwilling earlier even to dirty his shoes, Yaakov here rolls around in the dust, leaving his imprint upon the Adama, the ground beneath him. And he coats himself, not in Esau's clothes like when he deceived his father when he was younger, but in a coat of dust. No more running. No more false assurances. Time to confront, to wrestle, to journey through and not around. Time to embrace the fullness of his humanity. The Talmud asks, Hai beheafko imo, my darshe be. This matter of wrestling with him, what can we drash, what can we deduce from this? Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi said, this teaches that the avak, the dust from their feet, ascended to the throne of glory. It is written here, and he wrestled beheafko with him. And it is written there in the book of Nahum, and the clouds are the dust of God's feet. The dust ascended to the throne of glory. In direct contrast to the earlier image, the subject of Jacob's dream, in which a ladder ascended to the heavens, midrashically there too understood as God's throne of glory. But the ladder, this straight shot to the heavens, that was reserved for angels. The way that we reach God is through our willingness to inhabit our humanity, to be vulnerable, to wrestle in the scary and the unknown. Unlike the immaculate angels who have a direct line to the heavens above, Yaakov could only make his imprint up high by getting dirty below. Yaakov often gets a bad rap. And frankly, much of it is kind of deserved. <laughs> but. He also provides us with a model of how God wants us to be in this world. He is the most humanly human character that we meet, a true descendant of Ha'adam, that very first person made from the dust of the earth. Yaakov leaves with a physical limp and with a new name, Yisrael, a name that we all carry as well, B'nai Yisrael, the children of the dust struggler. We might want to imagine that real, that real leaders don't get dirty or dusty, that they're like angels hovering above the rest of us. Dirtied hands and stained clothes reflect failure and fallibility, right? And yet, as that White Sox scout reminded me, a dirty uniform is the mark of true leadership and success. I'm sure I'm not alone in sometimes wanting to avoid that truth, preferring ladders and direct pathways to the hard work of wrestling in the difficult and the unknown. And yet, while my, while my JTS education has given me many things, it has not given me a direct letter to the heavens. For that, there is no tab on Safaria and no course at the seminary, and even this endless Kripke Tower staircase which goes on forever, stops short of those highest heights. I, like everyone else, must face life and wrestle in the dust. The dust marks that I carry are not my greatest weakness as a rabbi, nor are they yours as a parent or as a partner or as a friend or as a Jew. They are our greatest assets and they are our greatest strengths. Only by wrestling with our own humanity and the messiness and uncertainty of our world do we manage to reach 
the divine. Collectively, we earn the name Yisrael, joining our heritage of dusty wrestlers, Afar Min Ha'adama, B'nai Yisrael. I want, to take, I want to take this opportunity to thank HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Katonti Mikol HaChasadim, I am unworthy of God's graciousness. For giving me parents who have loved me unconditionally and given me every opportunity to succeed and to fall in love with Judaism. For my grandparents who are here today, who model what it means to be a part of Jewish community and Jewish learning and build a world of justice. To my fiance who loves me and respects me and helps me wrestle and helps lift me higher. For the opportunity to learn and to teach Torah every single day. For the greatest classmates I could have dreamed of who fill me with hope and love and inspiration and for my many teachers and mentors watching and here today, past and present, who have helped me reach this milestone. Thank you in particular to Rabbi Jen Orbach, who worked patiently with me as I prepared this Devar Torah. Yossi ben Yoazer in Pirkei Avot teaches, let thy house be a house of meeting for the sages. Veheve mit abek ba'afar raglehem. Sit in the dust of their feet. And drink in their words with thirst. To all my teachers, it is at your feet that I sit, and it is, at you, it is your Torah that I drink. I have never gone thirsty. My cup truly overflows. I'll ask everyone to please rise. Those in mourning and observing your sight may join me as we recite Kaddish to Rabbanan on page 13. Yitzkadal v'yitzkada shemei rabba Be'alma divrach yirute v'yamlich malchute Be'chayechon u'v'yomechon u'v'chaye d'chol b'yit Yisrael Ba'agala u'v'zman kari v'imra amen Yehe shemei rabba mevorach le'olam l'omei al-maya Yitbarach v'yishtabach v'yitzpa'ar v'yitramam v'yitznasei V'yitadar v'yitale v'yitalal shemei d'kudasha b'richu Le'ela minko b'yirchata v'shirata Tush bechata v'nechemata da'amiran ve'alma v'imra amen al Yisrael ve'al Rabbanan ve'al Talmidehon ve'al kol Talmidei Talmidehon ve'al kol man da'askin be'oraita di ve'atra hadein v'di bechol atar ve'atar yehe lechon u'lechon shlam araba china v'chista v'rachamin v'chayin arichin u'mizona revicha u'forkana min kodam avuhon di v'shmaya v'imra amen Yehei Shlamaraba Min Shemaya, Bechaim Tovim Aleinu Valko Yisrael Vim Ramein. Ose Shalom Vim Ramav, Hu Yase Shalom Aleinu Valko Yisrael Valko Yishvei Tevel Vim Ramein. Amen. 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 Amen.